Bom, então, boa tarde, pessoal. Sejam bem-vindos ao programa de mentoria dos membros afiliados da Academia Brasileira de Ciências. Pode passar para mim, por favor, Ana? É, eu não sei se é a primeira vez né, de algum de vocês ou de alguém que está aqui como convidado. O objetivo do programa de mentoria, na verdade, vários objetivos é, desse programa, é contribuir para o progresso funcional, profissional dos membros afiliados da ABC, dos ex-membros também, né, e no caso, hoje temos alguns convidados, é, promover a discussão científica, é, especialmente com pessoas renomadas, profissionais experientes, mais sênios, né, na nossa, é, nesse meio acadêmico, é, encontrar uma linguagem comum entre os pesquisadores que estão em começo, início né, e, e no meio de carreira, e promover o aprimoramento da formação e especialmente é, fomentar que essas lideranças é, sejam formadas e fortalecidas né, em cada uma das áreas de pesquisa. É, pode passar, por favor? Isso. E aí, esse evento é o nosso terceiro encontro, né, esse ano. O primeiro foi é, uma, uma mentoria proferida pela professora Márcia Barbosa, da URGS, sobre liderança científica, foi um evento muito interessante, muito inspirador, ele está disponível na, no, no canal do YouTube da Academia Brasileira de Ciências, então vocês podem assistir, é, e o último evento foi com Martin Bloxham e Peter Hedston, da, da Barefoot Thinking, é, sobre pensamento estratégico. É, normalmente nossos encontros, eles acontecem nas últimas sextas-feiras do mês, é, hoje é uma exceção, né, por, por, por causa do final do ano e das festas. É, então, é, se vocês tiverem interesse em participar, fiquem atentos que a gente sempre envia os, os convites. Agora, acho que a Jaqueline vai falar das próximas, né, das próximas mentorias. Obrigada, Raquel. Sim, é, então, só para contar para vocês né, as próximas mentorias que a gente já tem agendada para o próximo ano. Então, dia 29 de janeiro, a gente vai ter uma mentoria para falar um pouco sobre a interação entre o setor público e privado, tá? Então, vai ser algumas experiências. Então, o Alex vai vir falar para a gente sobre isso, né? O Alex Prast, da Suécia. Dia 26 de fevereiro, a gente vai ter a participação da Gisele Manfro para falar sobre saúde mental na academia. A Gisele Manfro, ela é professora da URGS. Pode passar, por favor. E aí também, dia 26 de março, a gente tem é, mais uma mentoria, né? E essa vai ser sobre grants internacionais. Então, essa vai focar, é, nessa parte de grants internacionais, essa vai ser mais focada na Europa. E aí vai participar a Mônica Santos de Freitas, que é da UFRJ, e ela ficou bastante tempo como embaixadora da, da Fundação Alexandre von Humboldt. Então, ela vai falar um pouco né, sobre essa experiência. E também a gente tem a Charlotte, Grovitz, que vai falar sobre, ela é representante da Euraxis Brasil e ela vai contar um pouco das oportunidades né, que tem na Europa, um pouco da, da função, do papel da Euraxis, como ajudar o pessoal a poder fazer as submissões nesses grandes projetos né, que tem na Europa, esses convênios entre Brasil e Europa. Ah, então, essas são as próximas mentorias que a gente tem e agora, então, eu passo a palavra para a Ana aqui. Oi, pessoal. Eu vou apresentar, então, nossas palestrantes moderadoras de hoje. A Jill Cavilha Harris é professora nos Departamentos de Economia e Estudos Ambientais da Universidade de Salisbury, nos Estados Unidos. Ela tem doutorado em Economia Ambiental pela Universidade de Tennessee e, nos últimos 25 anos, vem desenvolvendo pesquisa no Estado Brasileiro da Rondônia. Ela investiga questões como o bem-estar da população local, a pobreza e a trajetória do uso da terra ao longo do tempo. Jill também é representante do Earth Leadership Program e também pesquisa melhores práticas para estimular estudantes com as quais conseguiu melhoras significativas nos resultados acadêmicos da primeira geração de estudantes de baixa renda e oriundos de grupos minoritários da Universidade de Salisbury. E a Thais Santiago, ela é bióloga, doutora em Engenharia Florestal pela Universidade Federal de Lavras. Ela tem experiência como professora no Cefet de Minas Gerais e atualmente é pesquisadora de pós-doutorado no Departamento de Economia da Universidade de Montana, nos Estados Unidos. Thais integra o Grupo de Pesquisa Internacional e Multidisciplinar que investiga relações entre o uso da terra, disponibilidade de água e bem-estar social de produtores rurais da Amazônia brasileira. 
Thaís investiga dinâmicas de desmatamento, uso de terra, uso da terra e impactos de políticas públicas florestais e também atua como consultora na capacitação e regulamentação de normas e procedimentos para órgãos estaduais de meio ambiente envolvidos na implementação do Código Florestal Brasileiro. Gil e Thaís, agora é com vocês. Uh, obrigada pela introdução, Raquel, Jacqueline e Ana. Bem-vindos a este webinar sobre as seis dimensões da liderança coletiva. Explicações e aplicações. Thaís e eu estamos felizes em explicar este modelo de liderança coletiva com vocês. Ok, um, so the agenda today um, will be first, we'll do some brief introductions, um, and then we'll be dividing the presentation up into three parts. First, we'll talk about three leadership dimensions called reflect, inquire, and connect. We'll do an exercise where we'll ask you to apply these leadership dimensions, and then we'll debrief. We'll then take a look at part two of the presentation and we'll focus on engage, strategize and empower. We'll do a second exercise where we ask you to apply those three leadership dimensions and then we'll debrief again. And in part three, I'll review the difference between this collective leadership model and what's known as the more traditional model by comparing how you might make decisions under the different scenarios and we can conclude with some questions and answers. Uh, we'll do some of this in Portuguese. Eu vou falar em português, até ninguém pode entender. And then, um, so the parts here in purple, we'll do in Portuguese, explaining our model. And we'll do these in English. But again, um, if my accent is too bad and you can't understand me, please interrupt and I will switch to English. Okay, with that, I'd like to um, go to Thais and um, ask her to introduce okay, obrigado, our role on the project um, because, um, well, I wanted to explain that um, we not only are going to explain this model for you, but we're also going to model it ourselves and explain how it is that we've broken down some of the hierarchies that might exist in, in, any, in some other teams and um, making sure that everybody in our team feels that they have a voice in what's being said and, and also is seen as a leader. So Thais, with that. Okay, obrigada, Jill. Uh, boa tarde a todos. É um grande prazer estar aqui com vocês hoje. É, já fui apresentada, mas eu gostaria de adicionar que em 2015 eu fiz parte do meu doutorado na Universidade de Salisbury sobre a supervisão da Jill, e foi lá com ela que eu conheci a abordagem da liderança coletiva. E desde então nós nós estamos trabalhando juntas e aplicando essa abordagem nas nossas atividades. Então, como a, como vocês vão ver, a abordagem é, da liderança coletiva ela é sobre compartilhar responsabilidades e co-produzir as coisas em um processo colaborativo, eu fui convidada a estar aqui hoje junto com a Jill para tentar mostrar para vocês como, como a liderança coletiva funciona na prática. Então é isso, Dil, pode, pode seguir. Ok, nós, nós estamos aqui hoje para falar sobre liderança coletiva. Achamos que esse modelo pode ajudá-los a média em que vocês começam e que, quebrar parte da hierarquia existe na ciência e na academia no Brasil. Para fazer isso, vocês precisam aprender como construir relacionamentos, desenvolver um grupo de apoio de pares e estabelecer um rede resiliente. O modelo de liderança coletiva pode fornecer a lingua, linguagem e as ferramentas necessárias para fazer isso. As seis dimensões da liderança coletiva são ações. Refletir, questionar, 
conectar, envolver, criar estratégia, capacitar. Vamos definir cada uma, explicar como aplicamos essas dimensões em nosso trabalho e pedir que você comece a pensar sobre como pode aplicá-las para resolver os problemas que enfrente. Então, a parte 1. Um. Demensão de, da liderança, refletir, questionar e conectar. Começou com uma linha do tempo do projeto de longo prazo que começou com parte da minha tese. Em 1996, morei em Ouro Preto do Oeste de Rondônia por seis meses e entrevistei 196 agricultores sobre como eles produziam bens, usavam suas terras e tomavam outras decisões domésticas. Voltei em 2000 e entrevistei os mesmos agricultores. Voltei no movimento com uma pequena equipe de economistas e ge geógrafos em 2005 e aumentei o tamanho de nossa amostra e projeto. Voltei em 2009 com uma nova equipe maior e, por fim, em 2019, voltamos com, uma, com nossa equipe atual, incluindo o Thaís, e expandimos nossas pesquisas de sede à região de Grande Ouro Preto do Oeste até as regiões norte, centro e sul de, e sul de, de Randônia. Hoje, vou me concentrar no que aconteceu entre 2009 e 2019. Depois de 2009, solicitamos financiamento várias vezes, com cada submissão levando pelo, pelo menos um ano para se ter preparada, apenas para descobrir que nosso financiamento foi negado. Três vezes, três anos e muito tempo. Então, nosso problema, como conseguimos financiamento para continuar nosso estudo? E a resposta não é continuar fazendo a mesma coisa, mas sim tentar uma nova maneira. Usamos as dimensões do modelo de liderança coletiva para melhorar nossos métodos. Eu começo a refletir. Refletir a velha pontos fortes, pontos fracos e valores. Identifique um desafio que resolve com seus valores e experiência. Avale pontos fortes, pessoais, pessoais e compre, comprometimento de tempo e vislumbre capacidades e da equipe que podem complementar as suas. Então, nossa pergunta foi, queremos entender as relações entre bem-estar social e usar da terra na Amazônia, e não conseguimos financiamento para continuar nosso, nosso estudo. O que temos? O que está faltando? Temos que reformar reformar nossa pergunta de pesquisa, quem podemos adicionar à equipe? Então, em, em 2019, antes de 2019, nós reflexão com outro projeto. E o objetivo é identificar as pontes fortes e correr corrigir ou compensar os pontos fracos. Então, fizemos isso e depois desse, dessa revisão decidimos que precisávamos de uma nova liderança. Katrina Mullen e não eu e dos novos perspectivos, clima e geologia. Então, 
A uh, Thais vai continuar com a questionar. Bom, então, questionar é reunir diferentes perspectivas e fazer, fazer perguntas, ouvir respostas, adotar uma postura de escutativa, aprender a ser empático com diferentes perspectivas, ideias e conhecimentos. Nesse processo, nós precisamos identificar os stakeholders chave, buscar perspectivas diversas, refletir e enquadrar o desafio conforme necessário. Então, nós tínhamos, no nosso caso, nós tínhamos toda a pesquisa anterior, uma, uma base de dados bem estruturada e grande, consolidada, recolhida com quatro anos de, de trabalho de campo, entrevistando produtores rurais desde 1996. Mas não tínhamos a intenção de continuar o trabalho, mas não tínhamos financiamento. Então, como a Dilma acabou de dizer, nós refletimos, entendemos que precisávamos melhorar o projeto. Nesse processo, a gente também identificou duas oportunidades, que eram temas que estavam sendo bastante discutidos, eram temas de interesse na época, que são é, a disponibilidade de água no nosso modelo, como a disponibilidade de água define decisões de produção rural, e também a questão do Código Florestal, que era uma lei que tinha acabado de ser revisada e promulgada e estava é, recebendo bastante atenção da academia e da sociedade em geral. Então, existia essa oportunidade de incluir esses dois temas no nosso modelo. Mas a gente precisava de outras perspectivas para poder melhorar o que a gente estava propondo. Então, nós convidamos é, representantes da Secretaria de Recursos Hídricos do Ministério do Meio Ambiente, do Serviço Florestal Brasileiro, da Secretaria Estadual de Meio Ambiente de Rondônia, institutos de pesquisa e acadêmicos e professores da Universidade Federal de Rondônia para integrar a nossa equipe. Então, a gente é, realizou um workshop de quatro dias em Maryland, nos Estados Unidos, onde toda a equipe se reuniu e a gente adotou uma postura ali de intencionalidade, aprendizado, empatia e pensamento sistêmico. Então, durante as nossas reuniões, durante esse workshop, Aconteceram várias é, discussões estruturadas e apresentações que nos permitiram entender melhor como funcionam as políticas de meio ambiente e recursos hídricos no Brasil, as dificuldades e os desafios enfrentados por esses servidores e também pela comunidade local. E também perguntamos sobre como a ciência, como a gente poderia ajudá-los a melhorar o desempenho das atividades deles. Como a gente poderia fazer com que evidências científicas chegassem e influenciassem a tomada de decisão. Então, no final dessa reunião, nós conseguimos, em conjunto, definir um modelo que incluiu aquelas duas questões que a gente tinha identificado como questões relevantes, da água e florestal, nesse, nesse novo modelo. E esse novo modelo também tinha uma, tem uma função importante, que é de buscar evidências científicas práticas e capazes de influenciar a tomada de decisão. Então, nós precisamos, depois disso, nos conectar. Conectar significa entender os contextos sociais e históricos dentro do qual o problema abordado está ocorrendo. E também entender como as redes sociais, os stakeholders, eles é, são relevantes para a questão que nós estamos abordando, como tudo isso se conecta. Então, nós precisamos, dentro da nossa abordagem, a gente entendeu que a gente precisava conectar a equipe e conectar a equipe com a nossa região de estudo, com o Rondon. Fazer isso tudo construindo confiança nesses dois anos. Então, para conectar a equipe, o que, que a gente fez? Nós dedicamos tempo para nos conhecermos melhor e para entender as expectativas e necessidades de cada um. Por exemplo, no final e início de cada reunião que fazíamos, e isso acontece até hoje, nós realizamos algumas atividades. Essas atividades, elas servem para quebrar o gelo, para estabelecer confiança e para integrar a equipe. Nessa foto aqui, por exemplo, a gente está realizando uma atividade proposta pela DIU, na qual duplas é, tentavam fazer, é, elaborar uma história que tivesse um mínimo de sentido a partir de slides aleatórios que apareciam na tela. Então, foi uma atividade divertida, que serviu para a gente entender o raciocínio um do outro e se conectar ali como equipe. Além disso, nós também dedicamos tempo para trabalhar no documento 
onde a gente definiu quais eram os objetivos do grupo e como nós co colaboramos e trabalhamos em conjunto para alcançar esses objetivos. Então, agora nós temos um documento ao qual a gente pode recorrer a qualquer momento, que esclarece nossa visão, nossa visão, nossa missão, nossa visão e os princípios que guiam o nosso trabalho em busca dos objetivos que definimos. Para conectar com nossa região de estudo, nós viajamos até Rondônia. Nada melhor do que isso, né? Então, nós gastamos um tempo lá, ficamos é, mais ou menos um mês e desenvolvemos um trabalho que a gente chamou de estudo piloto. Então, nessa oportunidade, a gente pôde conversar com vários produtores nos apresentar, importante que é isso, ouvir sobre a realidade e expectativas deles. Nós também nos conectamos com várias agências locais das cidades onde trabalhamos, com secretarias municipais de meio ambiente, de agricultura, com agências de extensão rural, como a EMATER, cooperativas e sindicatos de produtores rurais, e com estudantes das universidades onde passamos. Então, todas essas pessoas foram convidadas a integrar a nossa equipe. Enquanto a gente buscava entender o contexto do, da região onde a gente estava trabalhando a gente, e buscando parcerias, a gente encontrou diversas dificuldades. Uma delas foi é, lidar com a postura machista dos ambientes rurais onde a gente trabalhava. Então, muitas vezes, as orientações, as atividades propostas pelas lideranças femininas, pelos pesquisadores que estavam ali, eram desprezadas ou ignoradas. Então, uma, uma chave para a gente superar isso foi ter uma conversa honesta e aberta entre os membros da equipe, porque muitas vezes os, é, os homens da equipe não entendiam, seja pela barreira da língua ou não, não entendiam o que acontecia ali e acabavam reforçando a postura que a gente estava é, enfrentando, essa postura machista. Então, depois dessa conversa é, honesta e profunda e que não é fácil, mas a gente também teve aquela é, o documento que a gente tinha criado com um manual de conduta para nos respaldar. Então, tudo isso fez com que a gente conseguisse, é, ali naquele momento, superar a dificuldade e realizar o trabalho. Não foi não é uma coisa que está definitivamente resolvida, é algo que a gente ainda trabalha nisso, precisa refletir, mas ali, para o um momento, a gente conseguiu resolver e dar continuidade ao trabalho. Então, o que nós fizemos para conectar a equipe e o que fazemos ainda é realizar atividades e dinâmicas que envolve, que conecta as pessoas, os membros da equipe. Nós temos, existem várias é, opções, ideias de atividades como essas no site da Earth Leadership Program, que é esse site aí, se vocês tiverem interesse de acessar, está é disponível lá. E, para conectar com a nossa região de estudo, nós visitamos a região para construir confiança. Nós nos baseamos numa comunicação aberta e honesta entre todos os membros, entre os membros e os envolvidos, todos os stakeholders da região de Rondônia. Bom, agora, a gente gostaria de propor para vocês um exercício. É, nós temos um problema para vocês ajudarem a resolver. O problema é como desenvolvemos uma rede que apoia cientistas em início de carreira. Então, a nossa proposta aqui é que vocês usem essas três dimensões que a gente acabou de apresentar, refletir, questionar e conectar, para tentar resolver esse problema. Então, a ideia é que vocês, que vocês se dividam em grupo, debatam esse assunto e compartilhem as suas respostas, as suas ideias num documento que nós, estamos, nós colocamos no Google Drive. Então, assim a gente vai conseguir ver a ideia de todo mundo, porque aqui a gente não vai ter tempo para discutir isso, mas lá nesse documento a gente vai ter acesso a todas as ideias e a gente vai ter um documento no final que pode servir de inspiração para a mudança que a gente quer ver aí no futuro. Né? Então, para fins de organização, a gente gostaria que vocês prestassem atenção no número da sala ao qual vocês vão ser direcionados. Então, é, depois que você tiver esse número, você vai procurar nesse documento do Google Drive qual é o número da tabela que corresponde ao número da sua sala e ali adicionar as suas ideias, a resposta, as ideias levantadas durante a, a conversa. Então, se eu sou do, da sala 2, se eu fui direcionado para a sala 2, eu vou procurar a tabela 2 lá nesse documento para escrever as minhas ideias. Gil, pode ir. Se você tiver algo para acrescentar. Aham, uh -huh. 
eu, eu deixei a, o link é, na chat e um, um, as pessoas, quando você um, chegar à sala, fala oi, apresente-se, apresente reveja as instruções e responda a essas perguntas na, ta na tabla. Yes, okay. So um, I think we're going to, we plan on doing the debrief in English, if that's okay. It's easier for me to catch questions quickly um, this way. And what, what I'd like to do is ask um, just one, ask one group to reflect or to report out on each of the dimensions. So one representative from your group who's vocal, willing to, um, to speak out, just go ahead and, and chime in as I go through these. And what I'd like as you, as you respond is to tell us what room you're in so that we can all scroll to the, the same place in the Google Doc. So reflect. If, um, is there one group that had some really interesting or important points to make about reflect? Group one. Group one, okay. <laughs> Ok. Sabrina, quer, quer falar? Ou... Pode ser, então? Tá bem. Então, já que somos do grupo 1, um, é, então, é, nós refletimos, né, sobre, basicamente, discutimos bastante sobre os pontos fortes e os pontos fracos, né? Então, por exemplo, alguns pontos fortes que a gente identificou é, o pensamento né, menos uh, viciado, entre aspas, né, mas os jovens mais abertos às novidades, a novas linhas de pesquisa, maior abertura para riscos, né, projetos uh, que sejam mais arriscados, maior abertura para trabalhar com, com pessoas de outras áreas, né, maior facilidade para ser mais colaborativo. E alguns pontos fracos, né, que a gente estava refletindo também, dificuldade de financiamento pela competitividade, né, especialmente com seniors, uh, alguns ainda com, sem uma linha de pesquisa muito definida, né, do que vai seguir, também inexperiência em gestão de, de, de carreira. Então, isso foram algumas coisas que a gente refletiu. Ok. Ok, okay. good, thank you. Um, yeah, so do you see where the point of that reflection would be then to think then more about the, the, the weaknesses and develop policies and steps so that you could address those weaknesses. So if there's difficulty with um, getting funding, you know, what is it that your organization can do to help people get better at obtaining funding? You know, and usually when it comes to junior scholars programs that are like this, where you where you have people come on and talk to you about tips about grant writing and so on, could be really useful. Um, and then, yeah, it is inexperiencia em gestão de carreira. Uh, what is that? Inexperience? Inexperience in career management. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. How, how to yeah. deal with people, with the students. Yep, yep. Um, in the, the mentoring program that I run, we, we annual, it's, it's the most asked for ask. Um, we have an annual workshop on work-life balance. Um, and it's always useful. Usually we have a panel of three people that come on and discuss it from their different points because no, it turns out there's no one solution that tends to be good for everybody. So it's nice to have um, a variety of people come on and give their, their um, take. So it'd be senior people. So, so something for this group could be that you ask a group of three come to one of these meetings that's in senior leadership and provide their points and um, expertise in how they've managed their work-life balance. Yeah, so reflect is for that reason. You, it, once you identify problems, you can think about um, solutions. Okay, so what about another group for questionnaire? So oh, great. we talked about uh, how to uh, provide some sort of mentorship for uh, uh, researchers in different stages of their career, uh, either young or the more experienced ones that are told to be more experienced, but actually uh, sometimes they, they have to 
do everything by themselves. So uh, that's something we need to question and to discuss, I think, in the academic settings. Mm -hmm. And then Michelle, wants to say something else? Get Yes. Can I add? Can I? I, I was yes. trying to uh, unmute myself without without lucky. So uh, the point is that as soon as we get inside the university, as soon as we have uh, we get our positions here, we don't have any type of mentorship. You know, this mm -hmm. is what happens in, in in Brazilian universities. So we, we exactly. <laughs> they just they just say hello. Now you are assistant professor here and do your job. And, and that's welcome it. to the bureaucracy. So, mm -hmm. And it's the yeah, that's it. Yeah. That you I'm, do everything that you really don't know how to manage it. Yeah, I had, we, a, we, we, I had sorry, I, I had a, a situation where for the first five years when I started my, my career as a professor, um, I, I was in, in heaven because I had a lot of money and a lot of uh, recognition. But then after this first five years, then it was hell because everything stopped at once. They, they classified me not as young anymore. That was the biggest problem. You know, I think that there should be a, a, an intermediate stage uh, where people, they don't stop being young so suddenly <laughs> because uh, if, all the, if all the financial help stops uh, because you're not young anymore and you have to compete with the old guys, that is very hard. I think that was uh, what almost killed my career. I mean, uh, I, I, I cannot get as... Uh, um, a great big grants because I'm not old enough and I cannot get the, the money for the seed. I mean, the, the young people because I'm not young anymore. That's the problem. But also the, uh, the young grants stopped happening in Brazil. Like there were, except mm -hmm. for Sao Paulo, they don't, they, I, I entered the system and they never existed <laughs> for me. Exactly. And it's even worse than that some, some cases because you start your career and Usually, the department gives you the largest possible load. Uh, like, you have to teach nights, you have to teach also classes in different camp places, because no one wants those classes. And then you are the youngest, so everything goes to you. So it's even worse than not getting funding or not knowing how to do your job. I spent at least one year just trying to get my basic work done before I could like reboot my research. Uh, it held it for a whole year, at least. Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm, another big problem that I, I had uh, particularly, uh, when I had my kid, my child, uh, I, I had a one year uh, of uh, leave that was very nice, but it took me a long time to, to get on my feet again and be able to publish again. And uh, I think it took me like five years, not one year. And all the, all the agencies, they can't, oh, okay, let's give one year of uh, uh, excuse for this person who didn't publish, but it's not one year. In fact, it's much longer than that. So I think for a, for a mom and also dads that really take care of their kids, there should be a longer, much longer uh, excuse for not having a lot of publications. I think that should be something uh, different than it is right now. Yeah, so what I want you to think about as you're talking about these things is this is a collective leadership model. And what if the idea is that you are the leaders, you may not feel that you are because you're in junior positions, but that's, that's the change here that this model is providing is, is that type of empowerment that you see yourselves as leaders. So you're noting some questions and some problems that are common, not across Brazil, but probably across the world. The things that you're mentioning are similar in the US for me too. Um, and the way that you can best address them is, is by using what you learn here to network, build and change. Um, so for example, what I think would be ideal is that you lean on each other and come up with solutions because, because right, you, say you're in, you're, you say that you're in these positions alone, you get into it, some of you, you get into a university and then you're, you feel like you're alone. But now look how Zoom can connect everybody so easily from across your country. Why not, you know, why not think about peer mentoring? So. I run a mentoring program and I've done it for years. 
and the program matches senior and junior people together and they help each other. But um, the, the junior people also that are in this program form peer groups. And it's often that those peer groups turn out to be even more valuable than, than the connections they make with senior members. So I think you start to think of your group here as, as, as powerful as a group that has the ability to change things, but also help each other. So you might think about breaking yourselves up into smaller groups that meet regularly. And then, um, you know, if you want, I could provide, I could provide Anna and the others um, a, a methods for how you run these kind of things and keep people together. Um, but, you know, it sounds like you have some problems that are big common and you can't solve in, in an hour, but it's, it's, this model can help you solve them over time. All right, so think about that. And let's talk briefly about connect, you know, so um, how it is that you can extend your connections and start thinking about other people outside of your, your common network here. How can you connect, say, this network with others? that will have snowball effects. If you know that term, um, you know, will help increase the impact that you can make. So I'm gonna randomly pick a group again, unless somebody volunteers. Is there somebody from um, one of the groups? So Marcelo, okay, so tell yeah. us how, what uh, you're going to connect. Yeah, we, we discussed a little bit about uh, peer mentoring and and how uh, we can learn a lot by, by, uh, by our peers in our postdoc, for example, or PhD, we learn a lot uh, from our colleagues. And we have been having an experience uh, lately with uh, COVID-19 as uh, getting together with uh, groups from multiple disciplines. And it's been really, really uh, uh, great in terms of science. We, we, we were able to do uh, much more competitive science than we used to do before when we were just uh, in our individual labs doing our own research. So it's, it's, it's great, uh, the ability to connect uh, and, and to do bigger things is really powerful. And I, I, I'm, uh, I have been experienced that uh, lately with, uh, with, with this uh, experience. Oh, great. Yeah, and I want to point out that Thais also mentioned she provided a link for resources. So Marcelo, you might and others might think about bringing some of those resources into your group too. So what they do is enable you to structure meetings, Zoom meetings, so that they're more interactive, so that you can learn to build trust and, and start to uh, work together better. It's you build trust by talking. But then there's other ways that you can build trust with one another that can help that grow and happen more quickly too. So I encourage you to reach out and um, use, take a look at some of those resources if, if, you, um, if you're interested. Can you post uh, the link in the chat? Ah, oh, okay. Should yes, I just did. Yeah. You just did? Yes. She, okay, Thais just yeah. did. Yeah, it's a link to the Earth Leadership Program. And what you're looking for are handout. There's a, a group of, res there's a, there's a lot on the website, but there's a list of resources on that page. Okay, but we need to then in to um, to move over back to Thais, who's going to continue with the presentation, our part two. Um, the next two parts are shorter, so we will still have plenty of time to do our next exercise. We'll get to do something similar to this with and apply those next three um, dimensions. So don't worry, we'll have time, more time for all of this that I think uh, a lot of you got a lot out of. Okay, so Thais, go ahead. Okay, so, é. acho que é em português, novamente. É em português, é. Sim. Por favor. <laughs> então, agora a gente vai para a parte 2 e nós vamos falar sobre as três últimas dimensões, que são envolver, criar estratégia e capacitar. Então, depois que nós voltamos do nosso projeto piloto em Rondônia, com um novo projeto, uma nova abordagem, múltiplas perspectivas e novos stakeholders da equipe, nós finalmente conseguimos o financiamento. 
da NSF, a National Science Foundation, em 2018. E aí, em 2019, nós fomos em Rondônia para entrevistar mais, mais de 1.300 produtores rurais. E, e então chegou a, a, a fase de a gente tentar se envolver. Envolver requer múltiplos stakeholders, mas ela, envolver é mais do que conectar diferentes partes interessadas. Requer também o estabelecimento de relacionamentos de longo prazo e requer que visões compartilhadas de trabalho sejam desenvolvidas. Essa coesão ela acontece quando partes são colocadas juntas para coproduzir conhecimento e co-delinear planos de ação. No nosso caso, o que nós fizemos foi desenvolver junto com as partes interessadas o nosso questionário, que era o principal instrumento de trabalho do nosso, do no, da nossa pesquisa, o principal instrumento de coleta de dados. Né? Então, com o apoio de agências locais, nós organizamos quatro, nove grupos locais ao longo de todo o estado, de norte a sul do estado de Rondônia, conversamos com mais de 100 produtores rurais. Eles nos ajudaram... A, a definir o melhor vocabulário para a gente usar o nosso questionário e também nós perguntamos para eles o que deveria ser incluído no questionário, quais eram as perguntas que a gente deveria fazer, o que eles gostariam de entender sobre a região deles e eu comparar com outras regiões, o que, que seria útil para eles que tivessem nesse questionário. Também aprendemos sobre a realidade deles, sobre o que eles sobre como eles definem as, as decisões da, de uso da terra, qual é o, a influência da disponibilidade de água nas decisões deles. E, e nós também conversamos, conectamos com estudantes de, de diferentes universidades, das cidades por onde passamos. Esses estudantes nos ajudaram também a elaborar e formatar o questionário e eles também trabalharam como entrevistadores na nossa pesquisa. Todos eles são parte do grupo e têm todos os dados, não só para eles, mas todas as pessoas interessadas têm os dados disponíveis, podem ter acesso aos dados de forma gratuita e aberta. Eles, inclusive, estão no nosso site. E, além disso, também é interessante falar que nós contratamos uma empresa júnior para poder ser a gestora dos recursos financeiros da nossa pesquisa. Então, todos os envolvidos ali fizeram parte, tiveram seu papel e sua responsabilidade dentro do nosso projeto. Dil, se quiser continuar. Oh. Vou parar aqui. Tá. Obrigada, Thaís. Eu, e agora nossas duas últimas dimensões. Crie as estratégias. Seja confiável, relevante e legítimo. Ok. E isso está quando você faz as coisas juntos. Um, Co-design, co-produza e co-implemente a mudança. Então, é, é isso não é quando você tem um líder, mas todas as pessoas na equipe fica como um, um líder. Identifique papéis, responsabilidades, prazos e métricas, métricas e comunique planos. E para nós, nós desenvolver soluções com residentes locais. Conselho comentário local. Desenvolver soluções com professores e alunos em Rondônia aulas e workshops online, até nós podemos voltar. E desenvolver soluções com as alunas doutorado em todo o mundo. Projetos com nossos dados. E a última, capacitar, inspirar e influenciar a mudança. Treine a próxima geração, inspire outras a, a agir, Continue convers conversas. Então, nós vamos falar isso com nossa equipe de estudantes em, em Rondônia. Então, por que fazer essas coisas? Nos, nossa visão é fornecer aos pesquisadores e residentes de Rondônia conheci 
conhecimentos práticos que possam utilizar. utilizar. E precisamos de múltiplas perspectivas para fazer isso. Então, vocês têm que pensar qual é a sua visão por EBC? E pode pensar sobre isso quando vocês fazer exercício 2. Então, esse exercício é a mesma coisa, mas você pode pensar sobre as últimas três de, dimensões. Então, nós vamos ficar, uh, você, uh, ficar em salas diferentes. E pode... E vocês devem usar agora esse outro link que eu... Uh -huh. Você já? Ok. Uhum. Ok. Uh, algumas pessoas têm perguntas? Ok, tudo bom? Vamos fazer break. Vou break. iniciar então as salas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you should do um, a follow-up, summarize what you've learned here, and then make an action plan to get things done. Yeah, it would be a great idea. So do we have until... Um, Do we have 10 more minutes or is it 45 or... minutes? No, no, uh, if you have time. Yeah, this is supposed to end at um, 4 o'clock your time or 4.30. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay, okay. No, I'll just time accordingly. No, no, we have, uh, we have time. I, I don't know if maybe some people have other uh, things to do. Uh, have okay, errands, let's try and debrief. 4.30 is okay. Yeah, let's try and debrief on what you just did, and then I'll show you the comparison of the traditional and the collective model. Um, so again, I'd like to get one group uh, per per dimension involved there. Um, anyone, anybody want to volunteer to talk about involved there? Yeah, um, so it's something to keep in mind when thinking about this, that co-development process That means um, it's, it's not that the leader on top tells you what to do. It's that the team together decides what to do. That's what co-development, um, co-process, all of those things mean. So would anybody want to tell me about ideas they had about the co-development process? Eu posso falar. I can. Okay, bud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we talked about, we are room seven. Okay. Seven, and we talk about to identify the needs of each young researcher, of each specific field of uh, expertise, and to discuss together with these young researchers their needs uh, to find solutions uh, for all interested parts. But mainly was that so to discuss things that we can identify the problem, but we need to talk with these people with. And mostly was that was that. So we discuss yeah. more about these strategies afterwards. So I don't know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So what it means is getting everybody into a room together, and okay. then yeah, it's important to hear each person. So you always want to do a go around. It's usually called where everybody gets to voice their concerns, and then you can come together and co-develop solutions. So it's not a solution for one person or another person. It's a solution for the group. Yeah, that's great. Um, what about um, criar? <laughs> I hate this word. Estrategias. Yeah, estrategias. <laughs> um, is there a group that wants to tell us what they wrote about that, ideas they have about that? I think I can say a word, maybe. Um, so about uh, stra stra strategies. Wait, what group are you? Oh, I don't remember. Maybe okay. Two. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. I think it's group two, but okay. I'm not really sure. Uh, anyway, so um, we discussed about uh, instead of uh, saying, for example, telling people they are doing something wrong, so they should do it better. We encourage encouraging people when they do it right, then give a lot of compliments and say, look, you are doing it right. So, so that it's more effective uh, to, to make people feel better and then they can develop uh, 
better in the group and, and feel, feel like they are part of the group. Yes, that came up in my group as well. Um, the, the idea was to uh, celebrate celebrate uh, positive things that happen to each other too. Yeah, so you might consider that a strategy because you're thinking, you know, long term is, is you want to celebrate or think about positive things rather than, than negative things. Yeah, and you're more likely to have a well-engaged team if, if everybody's thinking about solutions rather than problems or thinking about the positive rather than the negative. It's the way that the climate change debate is going about right now. I think people that are at the forefront of developing strategies for climate change are focusing on what they call bright spots. You know, where is it that we're winning? Not focusing on where we're losing, but again, it's like a positive strategy. I think it goes along well with that. Thanks for sharing. And then, um, yeah, the, how about the last one? Capacitar, empowering the future generations. How are you doing? How did, what kind of ideas did your group have for that? I, I can I can say something. Okay. We talk, uh, we talk about the um, not the state of, for example, the university, the institution should have to create a mechanism to support not only the young uh, research but all the research, because uh, the example that you told you you show you is that when you arrive as a new professor, you have to do a lot of things and you don't know how to do it. So we believe that you have to do a, 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 a mechanistic support in our university for you, but not it's a kind of a, a favor or a, a, a commitment with uh, other research, a, a, a institutional support to, to em, em, empower the, 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 the younger research and not only the young one because in sometimes everyone can can need some help in, in, in specific things. Mm -hmm. And what about um, thinking about this too as your, the students that you're working with? You know they're, they're the next generation after you. Um, how are you empowering them? If you don't like the hierarchy that you're living under, what about trying to change it and um, recognizing your students as leaders as well? Your students as contributors, your students have, have it, you know, having valuable input to the work that you're doing. That's a, another way of empowering. Okay, so I'm gonna end with, um, with a quick overview of, of the differences that you might see between these, these leaderships. So a good way of really understanding, um, oh yeah, okay, so a good way of understanding this, let me pull this, I'm gonna pull something over here. You know, is looking at what is not collective leadership. So all of you can see this on my screen too. So this is in the handout that we provided to you with the link. Um, so traditional leadership is more, you might say top down. So um, in a traditional leadership model, you think about leadership as a position. You know, I'm a dean, I'm a provost, I'm a senior faculty member. Whereas with collective leadership, we're thinking about this not as individuals, but as a collective process. We're all in this. Um, what leadership traits are most valued? You might hear this, decisiveness, certainty, and focus. I have to prove myself and show myself that traditional leadership. Whereas collective leadership is intentionality, learning, and empathy. Empathy is a really big one, understanding how and why people are different than you, how and why they're the same, and then recognizing, again, that people that are below you, like your students, also have value. Um, and of course, the people that are above you in your hierarchy, you would always say that they have value, but maybe the empathy with them is understanding that this is the, the system that they were brought into. And that's the way and why they're doing the things that they do. Um, traditional leadership provides, yeah, the people that provide relevant, relevant perspectives or experts. And here we're reaching outside of the academy often. It's not only that experts have 
have important things to provide with the solutions, but it's also um, like it, for us, it's the local community, the farmers that we work with, the students that we work with, they all contribute to our solutions. So how do you, um, how does the leader mobilize action? They create a vision for the larger group and see this is different. This is the co-process. The vision that we had up and we shared with you is not a vision that um, Katrina Mullen, who's in, in charge of the group right now, came up with. We co-developed that. We spent days putting it together and making sure that we all contributed um, and, and it was a shared vision. Um, how does a leader implement solutions? So a traditional leader will assign roles and responsibilities, whereas a, a collective leadership model will co-design co, co these. So the way that we do that is, is what you saw with Thais and I. It's not just that I'm presenting this, it's Thais is presenting it as well. And everything that she put together on hers were her solutions. Um, it's, she had full, she played a large role in this too. And the way that we do that with our team is that we usually break up our days into different parts. You lead that part, you lead that part, you lead that part, and then we, we come together. Um, uh, how does a, a leader grow? Um, you become more of an expert with the traditional model, but here it's reflecting self-awareness and noting both successes and failures. So of course you have to become more of an expert in your field as you develop in academia, but um, becoming a, a collective leader means more than that. The outcome of leadership development is that individuals improve their personal skills and abilities to lead. And here we're working on a set of tools that can be shared and enable groups to self-organize. And you could probably see how that's happening right now with all of you. Um, and how do le leaders view the needs of the future? Uh, they would take positions and as new challenges arise. And here, what we're talking about is transforming systems. So that's, that's, what, that's what we mean um, when, uh, it's what just comes out of my mouth when I talk now. I'm talking to you about changing your system. I mean, it, it's not that I'm going to move up and become, get a higher position. That's not necessarily the goal. The goal is to make the world a better place. And all of you see the world a better place if, if the hierarchy gets broken down. And that is not something that's easy to do. It takes a lot of time, but it is... Uh, it is well worth it. And this is what we mean by transforming a system. Okay, so something um, for a future meeting that you might wanna work on is think about a leadership choice that you're familiar with and, and figure out, is it collective leadership or traditional leadership? If it's collective leadership, how do you transform that into traditional leadership? And if it's traditional leadership, what would that mean? What would you have to do to make that collective leadership? That's another way that you could take what you're doing now and break it down and better understand where it all it fits in. Um, so I, but I don't think we have time for that exercise. So I'm gonna leave that with Anna and now um, open the floor for questions for me and um, Thais. Great, thanks a lot. So uh, guys, can you please raise your hand with uh, Zoom and then we'll go, go to the questions. or if anyone would like to speak up. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering whether I'm already applying collective leadership here at the lab, because I think most of the decisions we, well, I have, like I don't have much students, but most of the decisions we take those decisions uh, together and we discuss together and I rely a lot on uh, the different students I have. So it's not like, okay, it's not collective leadership, but it's not like the traditional leadership as I understand how it is. So I am just a little bit confused about the term collective leadership. So how actually do, can we settle this thing up in, in the, in a lab, for instance. Yeah, so so I think I think like you're saying, it's it, you're close to it. I'm not sure for sure that you're not there already, but um, 
but what I would say is that you're, what you're probably doing is taking input from others and then making decisions, which is in between the two extremes. Um, if you wanted to, to make this full, fully collective leadership, what you would do is take in, take in the multiple viewpoints and get them down to a decision or, or different viewpoints together in the room at that time and document it. And then you move forward on it. You know, so, so for our group, what I, the way that we're moving forward right now is we're, we're working on say 20 different projects at any one point in time. So there's a large number of us, we've got a lot going on. And what Katrina just recently did is she assigned us to different tasks. So that was not collective leadership. And everybody's a bit confused about where we are on each piece. But I think she felt it was quicker and easier to just assign people to things. But what I think is if, if we had together designed those pieces, we would all, nobody would have questions as to where we are or what we're supposed to be doing. So if you're taking input from, from the members in your lab, if you were to have a whiteboard or do something you know, together, if you're on Zoom, there's lots of new tools that you can use too. Um, Jamboard's a great one if you've heard of that. Um, but you can, you can take the next step and say, okay, these are, this is our mission. This is our vision. These are our goals. You know, I think missions and visions are great because what they do is it's, if, some, if it's in your mission, you move forward and you're not sure how much time you should spend on something. If it's in your mission, it's worth your time. If it's not, then you know that you can scrap that. So mission, vision, goals, those kind of things would, would take you that one step further, I think. Thank you. There's a question from Fernanda. Thanks, Anna. Uh, it's more like a, like a, more of a comment than a question, actually. I think it's kind of cool also to realize that the collective lead leadership takes, takes work to make it happen. And it's, it won't happen from one day to the other. That's the, the feeling I have since I started off, started off trying to implement in my group. The first time around, I did a workshop on collective leadership earlier this year. And also to realize that it's very hard to be a collective leader in all the, 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 the six steps, right? Not, no, one person can't be good at everything. So it's uh, one thing that I did that is in that link that you guys sent is the spider graph, mm -hmm. which is it's just a PDF that you can print. And then you kind of say, oh, am I a good reflector or a, a person that inquire a lot or... And then you kind of can map your own comfort zone and see that others in your group might help with whatever you feel weaker in that point, for example, because it, it takes a lot of time to plan everything, involve everyone. Uh, and I think that at least the, 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 the online system help it up a little bit in that sense that as Jill suggested, can use like online documents or the boards and stuff, but it's, it's still very easy to feel a failure because it's like to be a collected leader, it's just so much that you need to do to be, look at that. So if you are aiming to feel all the, those ticking points that you, we just saw, it seems like a lot to do, right? So um, I think that it's a step at a time, starting off in our own labs and then in the department and then in the whole institution and I mean, which is what I want to say about ABC and the affiliates. Thank you so much because that's sort of a out, outside or, or top down in the sense of you guys are providing us that opportunity. So thank you very much for, for everybody, Jill, uh, uh, Thais, and of course, all the, the ones that are organizing for us. Thank you. Yeah, Fernanda, thank you for that. You're absolutely right. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, you can't do it all. Um, that's what the co-development's about. Lean on your team. Not everybody has to do everything, but you're right. It is overwhelming to think that you'd have to do all these things to be a collective leader. You don't. 
you can focus on one or more. You can just build on what your strengths are. I think what's most important that we found seems to be a common thread for everybody who uses this is, is um, building trust and empathy. You can get away with a lot, a lot of um, a lot of weaknesses if people trust you, and you, you can and you know so trust is is really important. You can make mistakes if your team trusts you. You can learn if people trust. So I think that was the most common thread among the people who've worked with this. But a little history on it. it the reason the reason collective leadership has come about and evolved is because of the climate crisis. Um, because of wicked, what's called wicked problems, problems that don't have easy solutions. So, so it is something that's intended to be impactful over time. It, it, so Fernanda's right on all of that too. It's not something that can develop um, really quickly. It's something that you do have to work on over time, but it's, it's for problems it's for little problems, but also it was established for, for wicked problems that take major change to address. So it was, it's called sustainability science are the scientists that came up with the model in the Earth Leadership Program. And, and they're starting to make a lot of headway in, in climate change. Thank you. Uh, Fernanda, do, do you mean others in your group? Um... You mean students or other colleagues? It, it, was that to me, Anna? Sorry. Yes. 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 Uh, actually, both, but mostly the, the students in my group. I started off smaller, like locally, because if you tend to try too much, and I was uh, talking a bit in the in the group, that there there is all those tensions in the institutions, right, of people that are more established, are not so open to the new sort of uh, leadership necessarily, but I think starting bottom up or from our own groups, I mean, with time it will show up valuable because you see that the group is getting stronger. And uh, so I do that a lot in my own group, especially in terms of uh, uh, lab meetings all the weeks and, and try to scale up the activities between people, not leaving only one people responsible for one thing. So they understand what everybody is doing and collaboration between them, which is something that I think it, it's uh, uh, something that we kind of miss a lot in Brazil that seems that the students that are each one doing their own projects, but they don't help themselves a lot. So stuff like that, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk later on with you and then whenever, whoever wants. I think Omar had a question. Yes, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I am just uh, with a question or just a, a solution or any suggestion, how to involve our uh, leader or our chief, chief department or dean of the department to change the perspective because uh, uh, thinking locally, we can change our perspective and our action with our students, our colleagues with the same age or something with the same feeling. But then in the upper level, we have the problem how to involve people or uh, I don't know, older colleagues in this kind of collecting leadership. Why that? Because COVID, have gave, give us the big challenge, how to change faster to, to try to make our research, uh, to get money, to get funding, how to restructure our department as well. So the answer of the, this kind of holder leader is not able to answer to the needs in the shorter times. So again, my question is how to involve the older leader to change the mind and to try to be closer of this idea of collective leadership? Because all of us that we are in this meeting, I think are the feeling to try to change. But the point if we have uh, like the barrier with uh, the people above, 
us. So please, any suggestion to, to try? Because I try with the design thinking, but also this collecting leadership is something that could be cross the, I don't know, the strategies, please. Um, yeah, I think I would, I would go about it with different strategies, depending on the viewpoint of your senior member. So, so I would think when it comes to seniors that you want to look for champions. So these are people who have the viewpoints that you have, that it is time for change and they're willing to work with you. Um, so those people, you don't have to win over, but you need them because they'll be important to winning over other seniors. Um, so it could be that they're smaller in number than the others, but find yourself a champion. Find somebody who's willing to go to bat for you, for someone, someone who's willing to, to work with you on this in a senior position. Um, and if you can't find somebody where you currently are, you reach out to the network that you're establishing here and see if you can move beyond that. And if you can't, then you've got to increase your network. <laughs> Be persistent. Um, the second thing is then if you have people who are against this model that are at your university or in your department that you need to win over, um, I think that starts with building trust. And that's a slower process, but it's, you know, think about your strengths and weaknesses in terms of personality and how it is you could go about winning somebody over. Um, for me personally, I, I can usually win people over by food and drinks. I, I mean, that's an important part of, of um, how I work and how a lot of people work. You know, having open conversations over food and drinks is, is great. Um, and then the other thing is doing the hard work. If, if you want someone to do something for you, do it, make it easy. You know, so, so if you're asking, say, a senior person, if, if they can help you with X, Y, and Z, do X, Y, and Z and say, would you, can you add to this? Can you provide input? You know, um, and then um, another way is, is doing the hard work is, is providing evidence that what you're doing or you want will somehow benefit them. Does that help? Yeah. Fernanda? Okay, so Jill, I was going to ask you, is there some, some sort of a resource that you could recommend us maybe to share with, with the students, for example? Because I remember the other workshop I did, they said very clear, it's not like the next week you will start and say, okay, guys, I'm going to do collective leadership. It's something that has to go in, as you were saying, without people even noticing that's happening, right? But mm -hmm. at the same point, it's kind of hard to make all of the sound and people get this, this concepts. And so I was just wondering, is there any sort of YouTube video that, uh, I mean, we could share with them? Just oh. an overview of the idea, for example. Yes, yes, there is on the, on the Earth Leadership Program website. I will, I'll shoot it over to you right now. Um, and there's an article that we just wrote. It's, um, it was um, ex an Ecology and Society is the name of the journal and it's in revision. So it should be accepted in a couple of, we think it's gonna be accepted in a couple of weeks. I could send the, the draft paper to you though. And then I could follow up when it's, when it's published. Wonderful, thanks and congrats on the paper. Oh, thanks. Here, here, and let me show you. This is the main, the main ELP website. So if you click on that, or I could just share my screen. I can show you. Um, okay, here. So take a look. This is the the main website, and if you scroll down right here, it's a, that's exactly what you were asking for. This is. Um, this is a video that explains this model. It's, um, it's in four minutes. You see it? 
Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's nice. really nice. More questions? We have uh, a few more minutes. If not, I have one uh, that I think we discussed a few times uh, together with Raquel and Jacqueline, that uh, we are in, in this sandwich position that uh, we're trying to change and we have the seniors uh, that uh, won't give us a space, uh, but we also have uh, students that we want to apply this leadership uh, model but sometimes there's a lack of respect. Maybe, I don't know if it's the best word. Uh, how, oh, can, right. mm -hmm. how to deal with this? Because uh, we're trying, so we're right in the, in the middle. Like the students will want that, this collective leadership sometimes, but uh, how to deal with possible problems that might arise? Ah, yeah, so credibility. Um, yeah, I wonder if, if a program that's supported by a group of you would help. Okay, so, so I always find that credibility comes from uh, different sources. So your credibility is going to come from your background and what people understand about that. It's going to be how it is that you perform in person. Um, but then the third way is it always comes, it can come from perspectives of people that are different. Um, so in other words, oh yeah, funny one. Um, my husband is one of the team members uh, that we work with. Um, yeah, so, and he's a geographer and he, he puts together all the GIS data for us and he needs to it's always a one-way relationship. I always need his data. He never needs mine. So I am always asking him for something. And if I ask him, um, sometimes I don't get a response because it's just me nagging about more stuff. Um, but if, if the group of us asks him, he's right on it. You know, so having a, another team member that also needs it provides more credibility. Um, so that's a, maybe a, a, um, an example that you might not to relate too much to as much, but, but think about it. So if you're explaining this leadership or something that you need students to do um, individually, but then you have colleagues that are somehow meeting with these other students, you, um, that adds credibility to it too. So if your colleagues from another university, maybe in the group that you're forming here, um, are doing the same thing or providing guest lectures for your group, yeah, you could do, um, if you're doing training with students, you could do group training where one of, a, one of you trains a group of students from multiple universities and the two of you. So if it was you and Raquel, and Raquel, you two would be collaborating over Zoom too. And they would see the respect that you have for each other and would learn more about what you do to each other, with each other. And that could add to your credibility. You know, so you have control over the other things too. You, you have control over your research, what you're doing, your Vita. Um, you get credibility that way. You have control over how it is that you present yourself to your students and your level of confidence that adds credibility. But then maybe something you could add to that too is, is gaining credibility from your network of other scientists. So students are more aware of your position in, in the research world. Great. Any more questions? So thank you so much, Jill and Thais. It was very nice. Yeah, we will uh, we'll follow up with the documents that you've been putting together because those are resources now for you to move forward with. So I'll send you that and um, send you a, a summary with all the other links. Now we have also a network of people that are interested in uh, these kind of things and we have uh, your emails and that's great. Okay, e Thais? Thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. It was great. It was a pleasure to be here. And I hope to see you all someday <laughs> again. Yeah, same here.
Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.